on Elm Street. Shots started being fired from behind, and I assumed that it was Mr. Nicoletti because he was the one who was in the building, and I knew that Johnny Roselli was there. And uh, I remember the shots ringing out, and even though the president was being hit with the rounds, I was considering it a miss because I knew that we were going for a headshot on the president. And I had known he had been hit in the body, but I didn't know what part at that time. And I seen the body lurch, and I saw the body lurch again. I heard another shot that missed, and we were supposed to hit no one but Conley. I mean, no one but Mr. Kennedy. And I guess Governor Conley got hit with one of the rounds at that point. And I wasn't even sure of that because I was keeping Kennedy as best I could in the scope on the fireball. And when I got to the point where I thought it would be the last field of fire, I had zeroed in because if I waited any longer, then Jacqueline Kennedy would have been in the line of fire. And I had been instructed for nothing to happen to her. And at that moment, I figured this is my last chance for a shot, and he still had not been hit in the head. So as I fired that round, Mr. Nicoletti and I had fired approximately at the same time as the hit started forward, then it went backward. Okay, my name is Jerry Croft, and I'm a professor of psychology at Santa Clara University, retired. And a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Conspiracy in Camelot. And it was called The Complete History of the Assassination. It was very academic, a thousand footnotes. Every mafiosi was listed. Every anti-Castro Cuban was listed. Uh, all the theories were presented, pro and con, including the Warren Commission. And um, I, you know, I wanted to make it as exhaustive and complete as possible. And Arthur Schlesinger was a historian. He wrote a thousand-page history of JFK, never mentioned a single mistress of John F. Kennedy. Well, John F. Kennedy had 33 mistresses in 33 months, and they were not... He, Schlesinger said that wasn't relevant. To sleep with the girlfriend of the head of the mafia isn't relevant? Anyway, these are just some of Kennedy's uh, uh, liaisons in his time in office. And they were not just one-night stands. Judith Campbell went on a long time, Mimi Beardsley a long time, Mary Pinchot Meyer quite a number of months, and it could have been the last person to sleep with Kennedy. Uh, but there were one-night stands, too. Now, Kennedy was not particularly a good lover, uh, as uh, compulsive and addicted as he was to sex. Um, if you... Uh, Angie Dickinson, I think, said uh, it was the most exciting 20 seconds of my life. He didn't um, last very long, in other words. Um, if you look at a sample of men who cheat on their wives, 1% of that demographic have had more than five extramarital connections in a year. Kennedy had way more than that. So Kennedy is two standard deviations above the mean of men who cheat on their wives. Okay. Now, if we got a group of clinical psychologists together and said, is there a diagnosis for this now in 2018? I think he would qualify for having a hypersexual disorder. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that would be a very likely diagnostic assessment that Kennedy, in effect, had a mental illness. And that's hard for a lot of people to uh, accept. So anyway, um, people said after that book, could you please write a book with ha that has just one theory, the best explanation for the Kennedy assassination? So this is a much shorter book. I condensed it and I said, this is the best alternate explanation to the Warren Commission. And LBJ was clearly indicted in that. I made a video. This was written four years ago. The video was called The Kennedy Assassination, What Really Happened? And 715,000 people have watched that video on YouTube. They didn't buy the book, but they certainly watched the video. Now, um, I thought I was done with this. That was four years ago, and I said, I'm finished. And then along comes Donald Trump, who, um, for all of his faults, actually did something good. He released 
almost 50,000 documents in November of last year and April of this year, just a few months ago, on the assassination. Some were previously known but redacted. Now they weren't redacted. Or the others, some others were never seen. I scanned, I swear to God, I scanned almost 50,000 documents. Had to get a new prescription. Uh, I didn't read them all. I skipped a few. I, I admit I might have missed some. But I swear to God, I looked at one and I said, oh my God, I didn't know that. And then I said it, oh my God, I didn't know that. And I wrote two books on Kennedy. And it was like one wow after another. So um, I apologize, but I wrote a third book. It's just out two weeks ago. It's called The Kennedy Assassination, What Really Happened. Same similar conclusion as Coup d'etat, but read the subtitle. A Deathbed Confession, New Discoveries, and Trump's 2017-2018 document release implicate LBJ in the murder. Okay? And I apologize. This is my third book on Kennedy. I could not stop myself after I heard all... There are eight, at least 80 huge revelations in this book that just came out. The media mentioned about six, okay? The media missed virtually everything. So I want to give you just, before we get into the substance of this, I want to give you just a few of the things that you say, oh my God, I can't believe that. Jack Ruby. We were told Jack Ruby had a strip club in Dallas, that he was familiar with the police, and that he shot Oswald, because he didn't want Jackie to come to Dallas to testify. Thank you very much, Warren Commission. Okay? They didn't tell us a few things. Now, conspiracy researchers have done a lot of research on Jack Ruby. He was mafia all the way. He, he was uh, arrested nine times. He, was, uh, uh, he knew Al Capone. Okay, this was not just a, a guy who owned a nightclub. And they whitewashed his whole mafia background. But here's a document I come across in Trump's document release. They're kind of grainy, but take a look. An FBI informant is hanging out with Ruby. This has been withheld for 54 years. The informant stated that on the morning of the assassination, three hours before Kennedy was killed, Ruby contacted him and asked if he would like to watch the fireworks. He was with Jack Ruby and standing in the corner of the Postal Annex building facing the Texas School Bot Depository building. Now, Kennedy landed at Love Field, drove 10 miles through crowds waving at him, and then ended up in this triangulated killing zone. in front of the depository. Why didn't Jack Ruby just stand out there on the street so along those 10 miles and say, hi, Mr. President? No, he knew what was going to happen. He was aware. He said, you want to see the fireworks? And that's exactly what they ha saw. And he placed himself right there at the spot. Jack Ruby knew Kennedy was going to be assassinated. Nobody really knew that. Thank you, Donald Trump. Okay, that changes a lot of books that have been written on this subject. So there is another story that is a little bit, um, a little bit esoteric, but uh, stay with me because this is really important. So there's a man named Eugene Hale Brading, okay? And uh, he is spotted, I'm gonna show you this, he's spotted at the Daltex building right after the assassination, behaving in a strange, suspicious way. So he was reported to police and he said his name was Jim Braden, and he just came in to try to find a public telephone. So um, they let him go. They didn't see any uh, criminal record for Jim Braden. Now, over the course of 50 years, conspiracists have uh, come up with a few th facts. First of all, Eugene Hale Braden was Jim Braden, and Eugene Hale Braden had a long criminal record, 30-some arrests. He was a convicted felon. He had connections to the mafia. And they, conspiracists, believe that he opened the doors of the Daltex building for an assassination team. Okay, that's the story.
But um, the curious thing is that Donald Trump releases a, 11 documents about Eugene Hale Brady in November, six months ago. This is one of them. Uh, Brady is arrested in 1953 for fraud. This is one of his many convictions. So why the question is, why would the government withhold the re criminal record of Eugene Hale Brady for 60-some years? Why? Well, probably because the government wanted to perpetuate the myth that just a passerby named Jim Braden wanted to use a phone in the Deltex building instead of a convicted felon with mafia connections. So uh, Jim, Jim Braden, Eugene Hale Braden, changed his name legally to Jim Braden two months before the assassination. So I guess he would have nice clean ID in case anybody stopped him. So that, that to me was like, wow, another one of those revelations. Now this is going, to, this blew me away. I'm sorry I don't have any pictures here, but this story, I wrote two books on the Kennedy assassination and never knew about this. Some parts of this story were known, but uh, this was completely new to almost everybody. Uh, Eugene Dinkin and David Christians. So Eugene Dinkin uh, is a cryptographer in Germany. He's a, a U.S. Army soldier, obviously must have a security clearance if he's a cryptographer. Eugene Dinkin uh, deciphers coded messages. That's what he does. And he comes upon messages that indicate that President Kennedy is going to be assassinated. This is the first week of November, almost three weeks before the assassination. He's in Germany and he hears the name William Harvey. William Harvey is a The CIA operative who's in charge of assassination procurement for the CIA. And he hears the name Guy Bannister, who is also in a, a New Orleans CIA FBI alleged conspirator. So uh, he says that John Kennedy is going to be assassinated in Texas on November 28th, six days later than he actually was assassinated. But it was in Texas. And it would be blamed on either a communist or a Negro. Well, it was blamed on a communist. So he tries to write Bobby Kennedy this information and through a friend, and he decides it's not likely to get to him. So he abandons his post in Germany, goes to Switzerland, to Geneva, to the United Nations press briefing room, and tries to tell his story. The U.S. Army arrests him for deserting his post, puts him in a mental hospital for six months. I never heard that story before in my life. There's a man who knew it was a CIA plot that he discovered three weeks before the assassination. He's alive somewhere, I believe, but I couldn't find him. David Christensen is another soldier in a different place. They redacted where he was for many years, but now we find out he was in Scotland in a CIA listening post in Scotland, and he also heard chatter earlier than Dinkin, early in November, that uh, the CIA was planning uh, a hit on Kennedy. He told his friend, guess what? He was also arrested and put away as a mental patient. Seriously. Now, here's the document, a grainy document about Eugene Dinkin. And that arrow points to the fact that on November 6th and 7th, um, he was at in Geneva trying to tell his story at the UN press briefing room. So these are very, very strange and incriminating stories. So I said uh, uh, earlier that um, I, a lot of people have criticized me for not telling them how to buy my book. So there's the book. Go to the URL uh, at the description page and uh, you'll go right to Amazon. Uh, I was talking to my graduate classes at Santa Clara University a number of years ago about Kennedy for some reason. And I noticed these are people who are bright 23 to 30 years of age, graduates of UCLA, Berkeley, high GPAs, very intelligent. And when I was talking about, I noticed some blank faces when I mentioned Jack Ruby. And I said, do you know who Jack Ruby is? 
and about 20% didn't. And I said, you don't know who Jack Ruby is? And then I realized, wait a second, these people, um, this was ancient history to them, right? It happened 25 years before they were even born. So here, let's t retell the story that they teach in our elementary schools, okay? This is the Warren Commission cover story. I don't think it's true, but this is what everybody was taught. And so let us go through it. So we have at least the basic fundamental facts. John Kennedy is driving. The, usually the presidential limousine travels at 40 miles an hour to, to avoid snipe. But this presidential limousine made a sharp right turn and then a sharp left turn, almost came to a complete stop, entered this triangulated killing zone, Kennedy was driving, a, I mean, he was traveling about 11 miles an hour when he was uh, shot and killed. The three shots came from the depository, so says the Warren Commission, all from a man named Lee Harvey Oswald, a Marxist, Leninist, communist, uh, lone assassin. Now, uh, the first bullet hit the curb, the second hit, bullet allegedly hit Kennedy, the third bullet hit Kennedy in the back of the head and killed him. There were no other bullets, no other assassins, no other conspirators, only Oswald, uh, and he's the only person. Now, Oswald was in the depository allegedly, and he left in somewhat of a paranoid place, he took a cab and a bus, got to his house, picked up his revolver, and went towards the Texas theater. He was confronted by an officer named Officer Tippett, he executed Tippett in cold blood, pumping a number of bullets into his body. Then he went towards the Texas theater. He had $13 in his pocket, but he didn't buy a ticket. His behavior was suspicious. They came, they arrested him. Prior to the assassination, Oswald allegedly left in late September for Mexico City, and he banged on the desk of the Cuban consulate and on the Soviet embassy saying, I want to get out of America with my family. I want to go back to Russia. I need a visa to Cuba and then to Russia. And he made a big stink and everybody remembers uh, or supposed to remember Lee Harvey Oswald. That's part of the, the Warren Commission mythology. Now, um, uh, 48 hours after his arrest, he, he had been questioned for two solid days, but no tapes were ever made of those interrogations. And Jack Ruby shot him in cold blood. And that is the Warren Commission story. Now, uh, can we now start? This video is called What Really Happened. So uh, we have, we're going to introduce completely new information here. And uh, probably the biggest discovery of the 21st century is coming. So get ready for it. All right. So November 8th, 1963, Oswald writes a letter. Dear Mr. Hunt, I'd like more information concerning my position. Hey, Lee. You only work in the depository for a buck and a quarter an hour. What do you mean your position? I'm asking only for information. I'm requesting that we discuss the matter fully before steps are taken by me or anyone else. Uh, steps? Who are you writing to, Mr. Hunt? You are involved with somebody and you don't know what you're involved in. You want more information. Now this letter uh, surfaces 12 years after the assassination. It comes anonymously from Mexico to a journalist named Penn Jones and copies to two others. So it goes to the House Select Assassinations Committee and they said, my God, this is interesting. And they, Marina Oswald said, that's my husband's handwriting. And one handwriting expert says, I'd go to court, that's Oswald. But another handwriting expert said, I'm not so sure. And a third handwriting expert said, I don't think that, I think that's a fake letter. So the House uh, Assassinations Committee lost interest in this letter. In the meantime, a, he misspells a word. This is the clue. He misspells the word concerning, and he spells it concerning. Pay close attention. Now in the meantime, a Soviet defector steals documents from the KGB, defects to the West, uh, lives in Britain the rest of his life, and reveals the secret history of the KGB. And he said, with a, a historian named Christopher Andrew, that 
That letter was concocted by the KGB. A lot of people believe that. It is totally, utterly false. Okay? You'll have to read my book to find out why. But it's an utterly false room. So, I was a psychologist when I first started my career. I specialized in learning disabilities. Learned Lee Harvey Oswald was smart, but he had severe dyslexia. He misspelled a lot of words, okay? He misspelled concerning. Now, if you're going to fake his handwriting, one thing, but are you going to fake his dyslexia? When he wrote the word Moscow, he spelled it Macau. When he wrote the word desire, he spelled it desire. When he wrote the word necessary, he spelled it neckery. Opinions were opiums. Oswald had very severe dyslexia. So I thought, what if I could find that Oswald misspelled concerning, concerning in something else that he wrote? This would be a great discovery. That's what I thought. So I went to the Warren Commission. And they corrected all of it. They published everything, but they corrected his spelling and his punctuation. Thank you. But there was a woman named Diane Halloway who wrote a book on Oswald, publishes all of his writings with all of the punctuation and misspelled words intact. And I'm searching for the word concerning. And there it is. Okay. He wrote a letter in 1961 to the American Embassy and misspelled the word concerning. Now, just you have to think, what does that mean? That means an awful lot. That means Oswald wrote that letter. Okay? That means Oswald was in the dark. That letter was written 16 days before he was murdered. He was involved with somebody. He wanted to know things before steps were taken by him or anybody else. He's, somebody else is going to take steps. Who's Mr. Hunt? One thing you can certainly take to the bank, and that is that the Warren Commission was wrong. All these books that say the Warren Commission was right, Gerald Posey. Riley, Vincent Bugliosi, that Oswald acted alone, they're false. Okay? All 26 volumes of the Warren Commission become disinformation. All right? Because Oswald is, he did write that letter, and he was involved with somebody, and the the idea that he wasn't is false. It's a big story. Now, there are a lot of people who felt the Warren Commission was not true. These are intellectuals, Thomas Merton, Norman Cousins, Bertrand Russell, Charles de Gaulle. They thought it was a whitewash. Uh, Hale Boggs was on the Warren Commission, and he thought it was a lie. Senator Sherman Cooper and Richard Russell also didn't buy it at all. Uh, JFK's personal secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, thought it was malarkey. Kevin Aides, David Powers, Kenneth O'Donnell didn't think it was true. Secret Service officer, Gabby Kellerman, didn't believe it was true either. John Connolly was asked, uh, do you think Oswald fired the bullet that hit you? He said, absolutely not. I do not for one second believe the conclusions of the Warren Commission, governor of Texas. And the American people don't believe it either. In 2011, there was a poll. 75% of the American people do not believe the conclusions of the Warren Commission. It was a whitewash. So the question is, uh, will the real Mr. Hunt please stand? Let's follow our clue. Who is Oswald writing to? Who is, nobody, no Mr. Hunt ever said, oh, he was writing to me. <laughs> nobody did that. So there are two major suspects here. The first is, H.L. Hunt, or one of his 14 children. He was the richest man in America. He didn't like Kennedy, neither did, did his son. They thought maybe it was H.L. Hunt. That, uh, that Why would Oswald, the, working for a buck and a quarter an hour, be writing to the richest man in America? But some people, serious-minded people, believe that's true. Well, I discovered a memo written uh, is from Trump's data release, one of those wows. Paul Rothermel was Hunt's chief of security, and he discovered that there would be violence along the parade route a few weeks before Kennedy was assassinated. 
And he writes a memo to his boss saying, I think there's going to be violence. And then he sends a copy of this to the FBI and the Dallas police. Well, if Hunt was planning on killing Kennedy, his chief of security just spoiled the whole thing, didn't he? Because he just informed the FBI, just informed the police, and just informed Hunt that uh, this was going to happen. I think the Paul Rothermel memo exonerates Hunt. Now, other people may disagree, but I think he wrote the memo, and it certainly would have spoiled any secret conspiracy Hunt was planning on. If he learned that, my God, my chief of security just told the Dallas police this is going to happen. So the second Howard Hunt is the Howard Hunt of the CIA. He's known for Watergate. He was arrested at the Watergate. He worked in the CIA and then retired. Okay. People say, you really look like somebody who was at Daily Plaza. He denied it his whole life. So Howard Hunt wrote 70 books. Fuck fiction. He was a good writer. But he was a CIA spy, too, and he helped overthrow the government of Guatemala with his friend David Phillips. Hunt denied he was ever in Dallas, denied he had anything to do with it. But he had a son whose name was St. John Hunt. Strange name for a son. But St. John Hunt lived in Northern California. His dad was dying. He was 88 years old. He flew to, to Florida. His dad just published a book called American Spy in which, again, he denies everything. His career in the CIA. But the son says, Dad, are you going to tell me what really happened? And his father opens up to him and starts telling him what really happened. It is the most dramatic deathbed confession in the whole history of the Kennedy assassination drama. Uh, and yet, he said, I'm not going to tell you what I did. Okay, I'm not going to get you in trouble or my wife or any of my family in trouble. So I'm not going to tell you my involvement, but I will tell you what happened. Here is an excerpt of his deathbed. By the way, the son is taking notes, making a videotape, putting it on YouTube. He's a brilliant man. I was on the radio with him, St. John Hunt. He really knows the Kennedy assassination backwards and forwards. Here's an excerpt. I've... I heard from Frank that... Uh... LBJ had uh, uh, designated uh, Cord Meyer Jr. to uh, undertake a larger organization while keeping it totally secret. I think that uh, LBJ settled on uh, Meyer as a uh, as an opportunist, Perrin like himself, a Perrin, and a man who had very little left to him in life. Ever since JFK had uh, had taken Cord's wife as one of his uh, mistresses, I would uh, suggest that uh, Cord Meyer welcomed the approach from LBJ, who was, after all, only the vice president at that time. Okay, so uh, remember one of those mistresses is named Mary Pincho Meyer. Uh, Kennedy, uh, I think, fell in love with her. Uh, she was with him in the last year of his life. Uh, she was ultimately murdered 10 months after Kennedy. He uh, says that he thinks that Cord Meyer, of the, very few conspiracy writers talk about Cord Meyer at all, but he was a high up CIA official. He said LBJ planned to kill Kennedy, used Cord Meyer to, Cord Meyer to set it up. So that forms the basis of my book. Uh, I follow his confession, but I add other things to it too. We're interested in what really happened, and I believe that his confession is very important. So his conspirators are first Linda Johnson, Cord Meyer, William Harvey of the CIA, David Phillips of the CIA, a Corsican hitman that was also mentioned by Eugene Dink, David Morales, a CIA hitman who worked out of Angleton's office, who was boss. Antonio Vessiana, and Frank Sturgis. Okay, I want to first talk about the mastermind, Lyndon Baines Johnson. So there's a book written uh, about Lyndon Johnson as the mastermind, a pretty good book. Um, there were three scandals that were operating uh, in 1963, and Johnson was in hot water. <clears throat> These were part of his 
prior psychopathic behavior, uh, the Bobby Baker scandal, the Billy Saul Estes scandal, and the Fred Horth scandal, um, uh, they were considering investigating Lyndon Johnson's ethical behavior. Uh, um, Bobby Kennedy wanted to get him off the ticket for 1964. He was in deep trouble. He did not like JFK, and he particularly did not like Robert Kennedy. So um, during the Billy Saul Estes case, Billy Saul Estes was um, arrested and charged with fraud and uh, there, Johnson's fingerprints were on it. And um, Bobby Kennedy said, if you implicate Johnson, he'll get him out of prison. He was the attorney general. He could have done that. Billy Saul Estes said, if I did that, I'd be dead in 24 hours. Lyndon Johnson was not someone to mess with. All right. Formed a criminal investigation of Lee Harvey Oswald and determined him to be a murderer without a motive. If you take all of these other possible parties who could have killed the president and combined all their motives together, they wouldn't have as many as Lyndon Johnson himself. He had personal motives, he had economic motives, he had political motives. We start with motive. Then from there we go to opportunity. Lyndon Johnson was involved in planning the trip. Yeah, he planned the trip. Uh, but before we get into that, he... Uh, was so panicked by the scandal that was happening with Billy Saul Estes and Bobby Baker, his number one associate, he and Johnson had done some really good deals. Now, I can't read this to you. He walks, Johnson walks into a senator's office. There's a lobbyist present. Um, he doesn't even recognize the lobbyist. He's in such a, a fury. I'm not going to read the expletives here, but I'm going to give you a, a sense of his panic. John, that's the name of the senator, that SOB, Bobby Baker, is going to ruin me. If that blah, blah, blah talks, I'm going to land in jail. I practically raised that blah, blah, blah. And now he's going to make me the first vice president of the United States to spend the last days of his life behind bars. Now, this profanity goes on for a little longer. You can read it in my book. According to one LBJ biographer, if Jack Kennedy had not been murdered, the Bobby Baker investigation would have would not have ended. If Jack Kennedy had not been murdered, the Baker scandal would have either destroyed or tarnished Johnson's image so completely that he would not have been on the 1964 ticket. And that would have been the end of his political career. If the president had not been slain, the truth about LBJ may have, may have put him in prison, as his grandma predicted, rather than into the White House. So Johnson was in hot water. He left Washington, went to Texas in October, planning the trip and staying out of Washington, D.C.'s limelight. He had a mistress. Her name was Madeline Brown. The night before the assassination, he was in a secret meeting, and uh, he stormed out of that meeting, and this is what she said. Let's go back to the night before. When, when Johnson came out of the meeting, uh, what did he say to you? He was so angry. He had a violent temper when he was upset. Well, let's use the, the exact words that he said to you. What did he say to he, you? He, uh, he grabbed me by the arm and he had this deep voice and he said, After tomorrow, those SOBs will never embarrass me again. That's no threat. That's a promise. And it, it startled me, really, you know, because he was so ready faced. I thought, Oh, well, he really, uh, something went on that shouldn't have gone on. And there were violent feelings that have never been told that was between those two people. So um, let's now go from LBJ, assuming that the motive is there, uh, to how he, did, how he did it. According to Howard Hunt, uh, his choice from the CIA was Cord Meyer. Cord Meyer was a very high up CIA official um, uh, and he worked under James Angleton. Cord Meyer was married to Mary Pinchot Meyer, who, as you saw earlier, was one of Kennedy's mistresses. They flirted in the 1940s. Cord married her, didn't like Kennedy at all. Uh, and they had a very bitter divorce. And then uh, in the last year of Kennedy's life, she took up with John Kennedy. And um, she was actually murdered, execution-style murder. At any rate, Cord Meyer is, the, uh, is Hunt's major 
CIA functionary who's uh, planning this secret operation, which is called the Big Event. Now, his boss is James Angleton, who was a very suspicious character. One guy said he was the most sinister-looking person I've ever met in my life. Uh, he had 200 people working for him in the counterintelligence department of the CIA, always looking for snoops, bugging people, finding out lots of things about people, and uh, doing uh, and uh, hiding documents. There's a lot of evidence that James Angleton was, n was not forthcoming to the Warren Commission or anybody else. Now, he was dying of, he smoked cigarettes, was dying of lung cancer, and um, he didn't make a deathbed confession, but here are his words as he's coughing, cl coming close to death. The better you lied, and the more you betrayed, the more likely you would be promoted. I did things that, in looking back on my life, I regret. Regarding Alan Dulles and Richard, Richard Helms, these were CIA directors. These men were the Grand Masters. If you were in a room with them, you were in a room full of people that you had to believe would deservedly end up in hell. Angleton took another slow sip from his steaming cup. I guess I'll see them there soon. So I think the man had a bit of a guilty conscience. So Johnson could not do this alone. He had to eliminate Kennedy to save his political career to prevent himself from going to jail. So he used CIA functionaries, James Angleton, Cord Meyer, William Harvey, David Phillips, David Morales. Everybody but Angleton was mentioned by Howard Hunt. And these people, in turn, dealt with assassins and the mafia, Sam Giancana, Johnny Rosselli, James Files, Nicoletti, Richard Kane. So that's how this plot unfolds. But the important ingredient here is the person that Eugene Dinkin overheard, William Harvey. He was had his own division in the CIA, and he was in charge of assassin procurement. He hated JFK, but he really hated Bobby Kennedy. He, was a, he hired assassins to attack Castro on various operations. He carried a gun with him everywhere he went. Okay? He was an alcoholic, and uh, some people thought he was a psycho. He had a very close friend named Johnny Rosselli, who was in the mafia. William Harvey's kids called Johnny Rosselli Uncle Johnny. Okay, Johnny Rosselli... He was from Hollywood. He knew Hoffa, Traficante, Marcello. He knew all of the mafiosi. He was the man who made the deals and made sure that, like when Kennedy wanted to assassinate Castro, they worked through Harvey and Rosselli. Well, this is an operation that involves the big event, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Now, there were lots of mafia, well, I mean, Robert Kennedy had put 700 mafiosi in prison in three years, okay? And um, the uh, mafia was in a state of panic that he was, uh, Ro Robert Kennedy was destroying organized crime in this country. This is what Carlos Marcello in, in New Orleans said. Don't worry about that little Bobby son of a bitch. He's going to be taken care of. The dog will keep biting you only if you cut off its tail. But if the dog's head were cut off, the entire dog would die. Santa Traficante said, Mark my word, this man Kennedy is in trouble, and he's going to get what's coming to him. He's going to be hit. They wanted to hit the president because if they hit Bobby, the president would destroy the mafia investigating his brother's murder. But it wouldn't work the other way around. And here is G Giancana's brother writes a book about Sam Giancana after Giancana's dead. It's a very important book. It's called Double Cross. We took care of, this is what Sam Giancana said. We took care of Kennedy. The hit in Dallas was just like any other operation we'd worked on in the past. The United States had a coup. It's that simple. The government of this country was overthrown by a handful of guys who did their job so damned well, only one American ever knew it happened. Okay. So this is the syndicate in Chicago, the major syndicate people, Sam Giancana, Santos Traficante, Carlos Marcello, Tony Arcado. But from Sam Giancana, we see here are the hitmen. And three of them, uh, of four of these four guys come out of Chicago. Nicoletti, Richard Kane, 
James Files, Johnny Rosselli was not a shooter. He was not, he was there kind of to supervise, but he was not a shooter. Those other three guys were shooters. So this is roughly the high cabal and how it uh, operates. Johnson uh, develops the plot. The CIA figures are there. The most important is William Harvey, Cordbinder, and Angleton. And Dulles and Helms, we are not exactly sure how active they were in this. We do know they played a role in lying and disinformation and destroying documents, but we don't know how active they were in the plot. But Harvey and Rosselli is the key ingredient for linking the CIA to the mafia and to the syndicate, which really wanted Kennedy gone. Now let us take a pause and start looking at Lee Harvey Oswald's behavior from, Dal from New Orleans to Dallas. I'll, so we're taking a pause here. There's 50 years of research here. So we know just about every cup of tea Oswald drank. Oswald moves to New Orleans in April of 1962. Um, his wife Marina goes to Dallas in September. Oswald arrives a couple, a, a little bit later to Dallas. Now, Oswald is work, working in a place as a greaser of machinery, and he's got a friend across the street named Adrian Alba. He, Adrian Alba is running a garage, and there are a lot of Secret Service FBI cars there. Oswald's fired, and he comes out, and he's kind of got a smile on his face. He says, I found my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And we've kind of wondered, what did he mean by that? Well, it, we think that he came in contact with Guy Bannister in New Orleans, a, a right-wing John Birch Society, former FBI, who now we learn was a CIA asset, and he starts doing political things. He starts passing out leaflets, fair play for Cuba. He's the socialist, the Marxist, the controversial figure. He gets in a fight with an anti-Castro Cuban named Carlos Bringer. They get arrested together. He gets bailed out uh, by a mafiosi, uh, a person related to a mafiosi. And then he uh, doesn't uh, learn his lesson. He starts passing out more leaflets in, and, and continues this from July 19th to August 19th. Trouble is, his leaflets, Hands Off Cuba, have an address stamped on them, Camp Street, which is the same address as the office of the right-wing Guy Bannister. It's also in the same building that Howard Hunt has, an, has a group of anti-Castro Cuban exiles. So Oswald, the left-wing Marxist, is operating in, a, in an environment of right-wingers. Now, remember, Eugene Dinkin said Guy Bannister was involved in the assassination, and so did a couple other people. Bannister dies, of course, within a year of Kennedy. Um, so uh, the people here, the intermediaries in New Orleans are important. David Ferry uh, was an anti-Castro person who really wanted to see Kennedy killed. He knew Carlos Marcello. Marcello he worked for Guy Bannister. He knew Harvey Oswald. But some of the Warren Commission people, like Gerald Posner, said there is no proof that David Ferry ever knew Oswald, and therefore there is no connection. Well, indeed, there is proof. Lex, you're going to need to read my book here because it's very complex. I can't render this and make it simple in a video. But there's a picture of Oswald at the age of 15 with David Ferry in the Civil Air Patrol. Yes, indeed, they knew each other. And Ferry was a right-wing anti-Castro person connected to the Mafia who knew Oswald, and there is no doubt about it. Delphine Roberts said, quote, Many times when he came into the office, he used the private office behind banisters, and I was told he was doing private work. I believed his work was somehow connected with the CIA rather than the FBI. So Oswald's deeply involved in something in New Orleans in July and August of 1963. Ferry, uh, after the assassination, David Ferry worried that he had lent Oswald his library card. He goes to Oswald's landlady and tries to retrieve his library card. And Oswald's landlady won't wouldn't let him in. We don't know if he uh, ever retrieved it. The Warren Commission never came up with a library card. So 
Oswald's involved with something in New Orleans. Now, I'm pausing here to, to remind you, this is a complex part of the story. This is where you need to read the book. All right. Now, I want to show you the wows that I got from this New Orleans Dallas period. And every, I mean, I looked at that. I said, my God, I never knew that. And I did a lot of research on this myself. Here comes a wow. Okay. There's a, a bar owner named Oresta Penna in New Orleans. Okay. After the assassination, he testifies in front of the House Select Assassinations Committee. in the 1970s, and he says that he saw Oswald meeting with an FBI agent named Warren DeBreeze. That's a very old, recent picture of DeBreeze. Uh, you got to imagine him 50 years younger because um, he didn't look like that in 1963. I couldn't find a, a younger picture of him. So he said, yeah, uh, Oswald was meeting with this, uh, with this DeBreeze a lot. They, they knew each other well. And DeBreeze threatened me, he said, I didn't want me to testify. And when Oswald moved from New Orleans to Dallas, DeBreeze followed him to Dallas. So believe me that he was either an FBI informant, he was doing something with the FBI. Now, he talked like a barroom owner, Arresta Penna. Now, the HSCA, the committee that investigated, also took testimony from the FBI and DeBreeze. DeBreeze, no, no. I never knew Oswald, never had any connection with Oswald, never threatened Mr. Penna, and I never went to Dallas until after the assassination. I was asked to go to Dallas after Kennedy was shot because they needed extra FBI people in Dallas. That's what they said. The committee believed him, did not believe Penna. End of story. Bye bye. But then Trump releases a document that is going to knock your socks off. This is the document released in November. It is, it is requested that this case be reassigned inasmuch as the agent to whom this case is assigned at present will be absent from the New Orleans office on special assignment at Dallas for an indefinite period. Well, Warren DeBreeze is going to Dallas, okay? But look at the date of this memo. It's, November, it's October 25th. It's a month before Kennedy is shot. He is going to Dallas right after Oswald goes to Dallas. And he's not going to Dallas after the assassination. There were plans to send him to Dallas a month before the assassination. Oh, my God. Somebody's lying here, man. Somebody is lying. Somebody got their facts incorrect at the very least or is lying at the very most. Okay, that's a wow. That means the rest of Penn are probably telling the truth. Um, there is an evidence uh, that was gathered by an investigator named Harold Weisberg. Warren Commission. And Alan Dulles, the CIA guy who was the, kind of the head of the Warren Commission, said there was a document that said Oswald may have been a paid informant of the FBI. Alan Dulles said, I think this record ought to be destroyed. It was. However, a very a strong investigator, Harold Weisberg, knew that they had transcripts and tapes of, this, of these secret sessions. He got the tape. He got the transcript and verified that Alan does, Dulles indeed had that document destroyed. So now let's go to another. Uh, there's a lot in Dallas, too, but I want to stick to the wows. These are revelations that just came out here. So I'm assuming that you've done your homework a little bit and read up on Oswald's behavior in New Orleans, Mexico City, allegedly, and Dallas. So there's a, a anti-Castro Cuban named Antonio Vassiana. He's mentioned by Howard Hunt in his confession. Anti-Castro Cuban, worked for the CIA, ran uh, missions of these mercenaries that went into Cuba and attacked uh, Castro's Cuba in the 60s. He ran Alpha 66. Now he's 88 years old. And he said his main contact with the CIA was with David Phillips, David Atlee Phillips, who Hunt also mentioned. Uh, he said, um, 
I was uh, frequently met with him. He liked to meet in public places. He asked me to come to Dallas because that was kind of his home base for a while. But one time I met him and I, I, I met him in the tallest building in Dallas called the Southland Center. He liked to meet in, the, in public places in the lobby. And there he was talking to Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. This is a CIA agent who is at the same level as Howard Hunt, who is allegedly the man who planned the stuff that was happening in Daly Plaza. All right. Vesia, one of the documents that uh, Trump released shows that um, um, David Atlee Phillips paid Vesiana $273,000 in cash for services rendered. That's a document that came out in November. All right. But this is the thing that knocks your socks off. Uh, uh, Vesiana is 88 years old. Last year, in 2017, he writes his memoir. Everybody seems to write memoirs when they're 88. And here is, you got to read this slowly because this, is, this changes everything you know about Lee Harvey Oswald. The lobby was busy, full of people, but I spotted talking to a young, pallid, insubstantial man. He didn't speak when Bishop introduced him to me. By the way, David Atlee Phillips' name, his code name was Maurice Bishop. Well, he didn't speak at all for the rest of the time we were together. He seemed shy and awkward, like he felt out of place. He attracted attention because he was trying so hard not to. I'm absolutely sure that Lee said nothing, not a word, not even hello. We shook hands, but he didn't talk. Bishop talked to me in vague general terms about the situation in Cuba. Finally, Bishop said something like, well, don't let us keep you, Lee. I'm sure you have other things to do. A teenage couple was coming in the glass doors of the building. I think it was one of their birthdays, and he remembers it, therefore, that it was September 6, 1963. The boy, Wynn Johnson, told me recently that he remembers it clearly, and after the assassination, he remembered Oswald, and he remembered the meeting of those three gentlemen. They said, where's the a coffee shop in the building? And one of the three gentlemen showed them. So you have to think about what that means. This is really earth-shattering. Um, Oswald is meeting with a CIA operative in Dallas. He has connections to the CIA. Now, David Atlee Phillips has been accused by a number of people of orchestrating the events in Daly Plaza. When I interviewed James Files, he said that uh, Phillips was his controller and he was also Oswald's controller. So, uh, of course, Phillips denied this his whole life, but just before he died, he admitted to his brother that he was indeed in Dallas. His brother hung up on him. So this really is very important information, and it's six months old. So, in late September 1963, Oswald is either going to one of two places. It's hard to imagine that he's going to two. One is that he goes to see a woman with two anti-Castro Cubans and uh, posing as a one of the three. And this is, now wait, this is a different story than Vesiana, so switch gears. Okay, here's another adventure in the story of Lee Harvey Oswald. And there are two that are very contradictory. And you may not know these, but it's important to know them. They're very, very essential. Let's do the Sylvia. Two Cuban sisters are living in Dallas. Their father has been arrested by Castro. They don't like Castro, um, but they're, they're, they're kind of not, but not doing much politically. Um, and three men knock on their door in Dallas, late September, introducing themselves as Leopoldo, Angelo, and Leon Oswald. And they remember that that Leon Oswald was Lee Harvey Oswald. When, when they saw the assassination, they saw Oswald, Sylvia Odio fainted because she said, oh my God, that guy was in my apartment. Now, what were they doing in their apartment? They were saying, we're anti-Castro folks and we want to support organizations that are against Castro. And Leon Oswald didn't say much, but he was with two other men who are anti-Castro. Now that we've since identified them, one as 
Bernardo de Torres, an anti-Castro exile, and Angelo, Angelo Mercado. Bernardo de Torres' name is in Oswald's uh, address book. So there, there you go. Posing as an anti-Castro, I want to kill Castro type person. Now, the other story is that uh, at almost the same time, Oswald is supposed to take a bus to Mexico City, goes to the Cuban consulate, knocks on their door and says, I need a visa to Russia. I need to get to Cuba. I need to get to Cuba so I can get to Russia. My family wants to return to Russia. He's a Marxist. He's done so much. Fair play for Cuba committee. All those things creates a big impression on both Soviet and Cuban consulate people. He goes to, he really makes up an impression that he's a Marxist and he wants to get out of the country. Okay, that certainly serves the Warren Commission well. So the Warren Commission heard the story of Sylvia Odio and uh, they didn't want to put it in the document because it was very compromising to the Mexico City story. All right, you can't go to Sylvia Odio's house in Dallas while you're going to Mexico City and making a noise in, in the uh, Cuban consulate. It's happening almost on the same weekend. So they said it was not Oswald. It was a man named Lauren Hall, a swashbuckling anti-Castro soldier of fortune. Okay, and that's why they didn't include it in the Warren Commission. <laughs> Lauren Hall said, hey, folks, I've never met this lady. And this lady said, I never met him either. It really was Lee Harvey Oswald, not Lauren Hall. Sylvia and Annie Odio, 45 years later, are videotaped. They have not retracted the story. One night, I opened the door for three men that came to see one of my sisters. I opened the door. They were in a small hallway with bright lights overhead. The taller man introduced the other two men. Leopoldo, he said that was his name.